Good morning and welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm Arelis Hernandez, a reporter with the Washington Post. Joining me today is author and scholar Greg Saras. He's also the chair of the Federated Indians of Grayton Rancheria. Greg, thanks for joining us this morning. Good morning, Arelis. <laughs> A reminder to our audience that we want you to join the conversation. So please tweet your que your questions or your comments to the handle post live. Greg, I'm going to go ahead and launch right into the book, which uh, I've been, been enjoying the last several nights. Uh, thank you so much for, for writing it. I'm curious, why a memoir? You've done short stories, you've done novels. Uh, you, you've I actually watched some of Grand Avenue as well. Um, why a memoir? Um, thank you for asking. I. I... I wanted to remember, I wanted to remember, which is what memoirs are always about, but I wanted to remember what constituted me and constitutes me as a person in place and time. That means calling up my ancestors, calling up the people I've known in my life, but also the landscape, the land and its animals, all the things that I have become a part of. And I wanted to see that and attempt to understand that my life in chapters, those cornerstone moments. So you grew up in Santa Rosa, is that right, in California? That's correct, yes. And what do you think you better understood about your journey uh, to understanding more about your identity and, and that process through this memoir? Uh, the ways in which people and the place influenced how I, who I've become, both as a teacher and a writer, and ultimately as a tribal leader. Um, the sense of responsibility that was instilled for me uh, for a place and for a people um, to do my part. Um, you, when you remember and you love a place and you understand how it shapes you, you become responsible. You want to feel responsible for that place. Uh, more and more today, I think, as people move from place to place and um, we're such a mobile society, we, it's important to try to connect with one place or a memory of one place. Um, I think that's going to be increasingly important uh, in, in the future with the environmental issues and social justice issues, particularly for American Indians. In the book, you talk a lot about the flora and fauna uh, of this place where you grew up. I'm curious what you want readers to take away from your connection to the land where you grew up. Um, uh, again, a really good question. And it's one of the important themes of the book. Um, again, the ways in which the land for my ancestors and for me, and the ways in which it's been changed in many ways compromised, is so important to understand and love um, we believe that all things in nature have power. Um, and I think the ways in which I have been shaped and understand, and I want to pass that on to the readers. So much is discussed today about identity, and it should be in terms of culture and history. But for American Indian people, it's also the place. Many people have come to a place. We come from it. And I want to remember, I want to remember my ancestors and myself coming from a place, from the land and the animals. The, the book is in many ways sort of a drawing out of that process of remembering, right, of, of, of making that connection. Um, and your journey of identity is particular, is it not? Could you tell us a little bit that journey and tell me who Tom Smith is? Okay. Oh, I never knew him. I'm not quite that old, but that Tom was my great great grandfather, at least. But um, anyway, um, I was adopted as 25% um, of American Indian uh, children uh, until the Indian Child Welfare Act in the mid 70s was enacted. 25%, approximately 25% of American Indian children were adopted, and I was adopted into a white family um, in the uh, 50s. Uh, and my uh, mother, who was white, uh, was young, only 16 years old. And my father was Indian and um, uh, 20. And so she didn't give away his name. And on my birth certificate, it only said un for father. In those days, they used to put the race of the parents. And uh, for father, they put unknown, non-white. 
And the narrative was that they thought he was Mexican. Many of us in California have Spanish last names, and we have a long history, of course, with uh, early on with Mexican Mexican history and presently as well. But uh, so I always grew up in this white family thinking I was half Mexican. Um, there was problems, the family, or at least typical thing happened. They, uh, they adopted me and immediately started, were able to have their own children. And then the father wasn't that interested in me and didn't want me. And so I ended up growing up on ranches and farms where my mother, who I'll always love, uh, tried to put me out to protect me from the father. And I grew up among the Mexican people and Indian people, Indian people who turned out to be my relatives, uh, many of them. And I didn't discover that until, uh, you know, my my mid twenties or something like that. Although I was around them and I heard the history and the stories, um, uh, I don't even I get embarrassed in front of you. But I spoke Spanish very well as a kid, <laughs> so um, I still still tell all my friends and family, um, don't start talking Spanish. I understand everything you're saying. <laughs> so uh, an Indian, I understood the Indian even before I knew. So. Um, uh, but then, of course, I found out who I was and connected with the people I grew up with um, and um, went to college, went on and continued what I was doing. And then when my ancestors and a lot of my family want, were beginning the struggle, we were the tribe was illegally terminated in 1958. And I wrote a bill uh, that I finally got through. President Clinton signed it in December 27, 2000, restoring our rights. And uh, since then, I've been chairman of the tribe. And um, here I was, a English professor, and I didn't know much about anything. But uh, I, my journey—it's kind of a bizarre, almost Moses story. This lost kid comes back and reorganizes his uh, father's people, and um, away we went. We're one of the most progressive tribes in a very short time in the country today. What parts of your heritage are you most proud of and what do you wish there was more awareness about? Um, a very, very good question. Um, again, uh, I don't want to say most proud. I think we we have to accept all parts of ourselves. Um, and the, what has happened historically with the notions of identity and race is that too much institutions, the government and others, academics, want to think about us in a box where the parameters of identity are rigid rather than porous. And so we're forced to deny part of who we are. It's historical. I mean, uh, in my family, because of the mistreatment of Indian people and so forth, uh, many of us claim that we were Mexican, my grandmother's era, because we weren't citizens till 1924, a woman could get raped. So there was this constant denying. And in my life, I was either too light or too dark. And we keep delegitimizing those within our ranks. We, we, so we have to be careful not to be ashamed or deny any part of us. So I'm proud of all of what I am. And it's taken a long time for me to get there. Um, but uh, as far as the second part of your question, um, I, I, my uh, natural mother was Jewish. And I, you know, so again, <laughs> By Jewish law, I, I'm, I'm Jewish. Also, I belong to two tribes or more, um, and uh, I don't. I know a, a lot about that, but I wasn't raised Jewish. In fact, I was raised Catholic. I say, born Jewish, raised Catholic. I've got so much guilt. I had to become a tribal chairman. <laughs> <laughs> well, as we as we saw in the intro video, you have said that the American Indian is the prick in the American conscience. Uh, the real question is, how do you ensure that the story gets told? That's quoting you. How should these stories be told? Um, uh, well, we, we need more to get out there. You know, what, what, what American Indian, uh, you know, Americans can, they tend to say, well, yes, slavery was bad, but, you know, um, we got rid of it. Of course, never mind the unfortunate and horrific legacy of slavery. And they can say, well, the immigrants chose to come here, never mind the circumstances under which the immigrants chose here, but came here. But how in the world are they going to deal with the fact that genocide and theft of land is how they are here? Um, 
Uh, and again, they've always told stories. We like uh, the wagon burner stories or the fallen nature god stories. Oh, it's so bad that the Indian fell, but they were into nature and all that. They love that when we're defeated. When it's a question of power or territory, we're always wagon burners. How are we real people, Americans today? And I think the important thing is for us to tell our stories, to become visible through the media, um, uh, television shows, other kinds of things that will get us out there. So there's accurate representation. But probably first and foremost, education in the schools. I'm working with the Smithsonian right now, the NMAI, the uh, Native American National Museum of the American Indian, to uh, create uh, a template for fourth, eighth, and 12th grades to teach American history and culture in the public schools and for the libraries. It's so important that the, an actual education shaped and written by us is in the schools. I jokingly say uh, nobody knew there were Indians in California until there were casinos, but there are always <laughs> more of us there than anywhere else. Well, could you give us some examples? I, you brought it up, the, the your work with the Sismo Smithsonian, goodness gracious, um, yeah. and, and pulling together that curriculum. But the, are there examples that already exist in media that you can point us to that, that do some of this accurate storytelling? Well, there, there's there's quite there's very good uh, a lot of very good books that have been out there. Certainly, Louise Erdrich is very popular, um, and she's out there and a good representation. There's a, a lot of writers. I don't want to start listing them all. Uh, Tommy Orange did a good job of portraying urban, young urban Indians in Oakland. Uh, again, people don't realize that 60 or 70 percent of us live in urban areas today, Los Angeles and Oakland being the most densely populated uh, per capita of American Indians. So I think there's there, there's, um, you know, reservation, there's shows on television that are starting to come out. But um, read the books, watch the books that are coming out. Um, and, and there's a lot of good history. Um, um, tr uh, David Truer's book is very good. Um, the, the, the Heart of Wounded Knee. Um, there's a lot of good books out there. Seek them out. Um, write me. The Smithsonian, you can. The Smithsonian itself has very good lesson plans and some very good programs for the classrooms. Everything from the Trail of Tears. We're just finishing one right now on the gold rush and what happened in the gold rush here in California with, you know, the federally financed vigilante groups to kill Indians and the, the, ultimately the miraculous story of our survival. Um, so there's a lot of stuff out there, but certainly the Smithsonian will be putting a lot of materials out and libraries and schools can go to the National Museum of the American Indian and get those materials. Excellent. Thank you for that. I, you know, I'm curious. We're in a time of book bans by uh, school systems, and there's a raging debate about what parts of our histories children are taught. How would you advise teachers who are looking to incorporate some of these stories, some of these histories into their classroom in a time that's pretty fraught uh, about, you know, what histories are taught? Um, good question. I, I was taught for 35 years, and it was it's kind of sad that um, towards the the end of my career that all this is going on. Um, I think and of course, the whole everything that has to do with any of us uh, folks of color or LGBTQ community, no matter the subject itself suddenly gets lumped into critical race theory and all this political um, business. And again, people don't want to hear about the American Indian because, again, they think, well, it makes us feel guilty. I didn't kill any of the Indians. I didn't do any of that. But it's a story to under not just to feel not to feel guilty about it all, but to understand, especially in an increasingly diverse and polarized world, how certain people look at certain people that allow horrible things to happen. What is it about an us them relationship with the world that's problematic? rather than a we relationship. And if we look at these ethnic histories and American Indian stories and so forth, we look, we can see the ways in which we misunderstood one another and look for ways to go forward. The story of American Indians is also a story of incredible survivance. And there's a lesson 
there, not to make anybody feel guilty, but to understand. In my own tribe, at the kind of time of contact, there are about 20,000 of us. Today, of the 1,478 enrolled members, we all trace our ancestry back to one of 14 survivors, all of whom were women, all of whom were concubines or wives of the early Americans. We don't know that story, but think of those women and what they did to get us here and to keep us going and to keep the language when it was forbidden to speak the language, when you know it was forbidden to practice the culture, but they managed. What survivance? Um, I get tired and crabby a lot, Aralis. I get, and then I think of what my grandmother, great grandmother, and those folks went through to get me here. And I say to myself, "Shut up, Craig. Keep going." <laughs> well, there are vast differences among those who did survive in culture, ethnicity, and language, and, and this is among the federally recognized Indian nations across the U.S. Why is it important to understand that diversity? Uh, uh, well, again, there's over 550, 580 different cultures and the huge broad language families. Um, every language found throughout the New World is found not just in America, but also in California. So, uh, and the cultures were so vastly different. Um, and again, as I mentioned earlier, the cultures grew from a place, from a land. The land determined the kind of culture. In California, there were very small, small, uh, or relatively small groups, nations, uh, sovereign nations of 500 to maybe a couple thousand people speaking a separate language. Some of those languages is different as, uh, say, Cantonese is from Urdu or English. Um, yet the old people spoke 10 or 15 languages, again, as different as uh, English as maybe from Cantonese. Um, and uh, we didn't have organized warfare here. We were much more subtle. We kind of poisoned you and you dropped dead the next day. Um, we didn't have organized warfare as the Plains Indians uh, who were more nomadic than we were. So again, it had so much to do with the place that shaped the culture and the Indian people. We, we co-evolved with the landscape where we have seen ourselves as living from time immemorial. So I think that accounts for the vast differences. We're not all alike. It gets very difficult for me, or at least when people come up and always ask me, well, what do Indians think? Well, which Indians? I don't know. Even in my own family, they'll tell you, oh, that's just Greg's idea. You know, Greg doesn't know anything. <laughs> so uh, I, I remember getting my PhD in Mabel McKay, who influenced so much of my life. Um, <laughs> I, you know, she, somebody said to her, aren't you proud of him? And as an elder, she kind of shrugged her shoulders and she said, oh, he's okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mabel some... McKay, who, who you mentioned in the book, uh, you start the book with Mabel McKay. Can you tell us a little bit more about her and what she meant Mabel to you? Mabel McKay, um, I, I have a PhD from Stanford and I, nothing uh, against Stanford, but this woman who had hardly a second grade education had more wisdom in her little finger than all the professors put together that I knew at Stanford. Um, a remar again, a remarkable example of survivance. She was the last uh, dreamer and uh, sucking doctor, a medicine woman in our tribe. And she wove beautiful baskets, the Pomo bas Indian people, of which I'm one, uh, are known for their baskets. Her baskets are in the Smithsonian. People would order the baskets, uh, pay, you know, in those days, thousands of dollars, which is a lot in those days but she wouldn't weave the basket. She wouldn't be compromised unless she had the dream for the person for the basket. She continued, this woman with baskets, an artist with baskets in the Smithsonian, she continued to work in an apple cannery on the line for 20 years so she could get her pension. She would drive 200 miles to doctor the sick at night and then try to get back to work on time for the cannery and then weave baskets. And I used to say to her, Mabel, how do you do all of these things? And she said to me, ain't no such a word as can't. Easier well, said than Mabel done, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mabel sounds a lot like a character in Grand Avenue. Uh, Auntie, I, I think is, and, and tell us a little bit about Grand Avenue and what it meant for you to see your work on screen. Um, <laughs> That, that was pretty amazing, pretty heady days. The first miniseries, uh, it was on HBO and um, 
uh, again, the difficulty of representation, particularly of California Indians, if, if Hollywood or the publishing world doesn't see an Indian on a pinto horse chasing buffaloes, they, they don't quite understand how they're going to put it on film. They need that Indian to be on a horse, I guess. We didn't have horses in California. But um, anyway, I wrote this book and I remember being at Stanford and a professor told me I'd never be able to publish the stories. And luckily I did. Um, Robert Redford liked the book, another producer. And I ended up going to Sundance, the Writer's Lab, big deal. I think I was one of the first, if not the first Indian person to be there. And they were telling me great things. And uh, so they got me a fancy agent or at least I go to Hollywood thinking, oh my God, I'm gonna be the next Francis Ford Coppola or something. And, <laughs> and everybody I went to pitch the story to said, why don't you write something like this for Jodie Foster? You're a good writer, but these stories are too dark. And I thought to myself, you mean the people's skin? Um, but anyway, it finally ended up at HBO and it can stay there forever. And uh, it was sitting there forever with no decision. And finally I was frustrated and I said, I called up Robert Redford, Bob, and I said, um, if you think that I'm you know, so good, why don't you say you're gonna produce the movie? And in those days, you know, if Clinton called China, they'd put him on hold. If Redford called, they'd put him through. And Redford made one call and we, we, had, we had a deal. Uh, and they gave me the opportunity to write because I was an unpro unproduced writer, right? And so, so uh, they uh, gave me a chance to write one of the three hours. And if I did okay, I could write the next hour. And if I did okay, I could write the third hour. Well, think about me wanting to represent and do well. So the pressure was on not to have some other writer come in and adapt my work. So I did all three hours, I struggled through. And then there was the issue with casting, you know, um, they wanted all pretty, they wanted share people like that. And of course, I brought some of the producers up to the reservation to meet my aunts. And the first thing they said was, take a look at us, we ain't share. So uh, <laughs> we tried to, uh, we, I won, I resorted to gang warfare and uh, we won. And I was generally happy with the representation, so. <laughs> But it was a struggle. It's a constant struggle. I'm so proud of the younger folks today that are doing this and, and have a little more control. Of course, we only had a couple al alternate HBO and Showtime in those days, and now there's more venues. So I hope more of our stories will get out there. How do you think that'll help Native American youth uh, in particular in, in sort of the formation of their identity and, and, and self-esteem? It's so important. Um, because now you see, when people see themselves represented, I remember when people first saw Grand Avenue, they started crying. My family and others, they said, we, we saw ourselves on TV, we saw ourselves represented. And when you're looking at television, when you're looking at ads and who you are and what you are isn't there, um, it's a way of erasing you. It's a r way of uh, reminding you of your invisibility in this country. And so when Indian kids see themselves on screen and see stories about them, it makes them feel legitimate. It, it makes them feel vindicated as cultured young people from particular cultures and families. And equally important, Aralis, it inspires them to be able to say to themselves, I can do that now, I can do that. Well, we do have a question from the audience, and this one's from Nancy Sander in uh, Oregon. She asks, how can those who are not indigenous be allies of indigenous Americans? Oh, uh, that's a, thank you. That's a big question, Nancy. Um, and there's, I, you know, I, I'm a professor. I could go on forever, but they don't want me to do that here. Um, so, uh, and I'll walk out the door thinking of all the things I forgot to say. But um, first and foremost, Wherever you are in the schools and libraries, ask for materials, ask what they're doing uh, there. What kind of materials, source materials are you doing about Indian people? In Oregon, there's many tribes there. And again, go into the libraries or public schools. And if they don't have uh, books or things about other uh, about American Indians and so forth, or particularly the local Indians, ask why not and say, can we work together to get materials here so that people can learn? Um, so I, I think that that's um, really one of the first and foremost ways 
to do that, to get our story out there so that people can see us. Well, so Greg, we're quickly running out of time, but I want to make sure I get to these questions. Uh, I'm curious, you know, with Deb Haley now uh, as Interior Secretary and increased Native American representation, not just in Congress and, and government, but also as we've talked about in, in media, how do we ensure that Native issues are given the attention that they are due? What issues do you wish the country was paying more attention to? Um, I think, well, it's, let me just say with, with Deb Holland being there, what an ironic turnaround. The very, the Department of Interior that enslaved us and in fact, in some ways owns us today. I mean, the fee to trust the land at 99, we have 99 year lease. We have an agreement with the Department of Interior. Um, but to have her in that position um, is just such a wonderful turnaround. Um, I think again, um, one of the ways that you, you know, the big ways that we're talking about ensuring that the issues come up, there are still huge issues that need to be talked about. We're an invisible people, regardless of some of us having casinos that are well, the majority of us still need more help in med with housing, with health issues. So we need to make sure that our Congress people and others um, ensure our uh, the it further support and allow monies for Indian health and Indian housing. I also think it's very important that people that in no way can our sovereignty are, get chipped away at. It's the only thing we had. We made an agreement with federal governments for our reservations in exchange for 99% of our land and the uh, genocide of so many of our people we were made treaties where we were given sovereign nations on, uh, made sovereign nations on small plots of land. Our sovereignty must be protected. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. Thank you, Chairman Saris, for speaking with me. I really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for caring and what you do. <laughs> Appreciate that. And thanks to all of you for joining us today. Go to WashingtonPostLive.com to register for our upcoming programs. I'm Arelis Hernandez, and thank you for watching Washington Post Live.